In the last video, we saw what a typical unit looks like, and I mentioned that I always give at least one ungraded formative assessment during each unit. I like to call these assessments free chances to make a mistake, and I believe they're useful for several reasons. First, it continues to show our vision that math class is about more than just getting grades. It's about learning and growing. Students can see with our actions that it's okay to make mistakes because we're not attaching a grade to them. Second, I believe these assessments are useful for teachers as well because they give us an opportunity to uncover common student errors. This allows us to make adjustments during the unit in order to maximize student learning. Want to learn more about free chances? Stick around and find out. Let's begin by reading a quote from Dylan William. Never grade students while they are still learning. As soon as students get a grade, the learning stops. If grades stop learning, students should be given them as infrequently as possible. One of my goals every year was to find a way to grade as infrequently as possible because I think Dylan William is exactly right. When students see grades, many times they either quit because it's too low, get complacent because it's satisfactory, or maybe get overconfident if it's a high grade. No matter what the response is, according to his research, grades stop learning. However, if we shouldn't grade frequently, then what should we do? And how can we do this while still knowing if students are understanding the material? Enter formative assessment. That's a fancy term, but basically formative assessment is just an opportunity for teachers to get a snapshot of student learning without attaching a grade to it. This type of assessment is very helpful for teachers because they get important information about student understanding that can lead to adjustments in instruction. Formative assessment can take on many forms, but one of my go-to methods that I schedule into my curriculum is the free chance to make a mistake. I'll call them free chances for short. After working on a concept for a couple days, I like to give a free chance in order to see where students are and discover common misconceptions. There's no pressure at all to perform well on these because they aren't a grade. In fact, I tell students that I don't even care if they write their name on the paper because all I'm looking for are the most common mistakes that students are making in the class. This is really helpful for students to hear because again, I'm backing up my core value that mistakes are okay in math class. I'm not trying to play gotcha, but instead I'm just genuinely looking to see how I need to adjust my instruction to help students grow. Here's an example of a free chance for my geometry class. As you can see, it's short. This one is four questions, but sometimes free chances can be as short as two questions. The goal is to get a quick snapshot of student work, not an entire encyclopedia. Also, you may notice that the questions are not advanced questions. I usually just put 80 level type questions on these because I want the assessment to be quick and approachable. I don't want any students giving up because it's too advanced, and this also allows me to focus my attention on the actual skill we're trying to build. Once students complete the free chance, I quickly look through them to find the most common mistakes. Not a lot of time is needed to do this because the goal isn't to assess every detail, but instead to find common, big misconceptions. Here's my process. I look at each free chance one at a time while standing next to the recycle bin. If all the answers are correct, I throw it away. If there are any incorrect answers, I keep them for further review. Once I make it through the stack, I sort the free chances based on wrong answers. Usually students get similar wrong answers, so nice piles can form. Finally, after sorting, there are usually two to three mistakes that are more common than all the others. I keep one example of each common mistake, and then I throw the others away. This process takes less than five minutes, and after doing it for a few classes, it becomes clear which mistakes we need to go over the next day. And that leads to the next part. Once I determine the two to three most common mistakes, I create the warm-up for the next day. Here's what the warm-up looked like based on the free chance we just saw. On this particular day, there was only one common mistake that stood out, so that's the one we analyzed. Therefore, I used my own handwriting to write the common mistake, and I asked students to think about what the mistake in the equation is. This is nice because instead of me outright telling students what the mistake is, they need to look at the problem and analyze it themselves. This is engaging, and it also leads to more light bulb moments when students recognize the error. 
After students analyze the error, I have an intentionally chosen set of problems for them to complete that are based on the common mistake. For this free chance, since the most common mistake was setting up equations correctly, I first had students set up equations for the different types of angle pairs we were working on. No solving yet, just working on setting them up. Next, I had students get creative and generate their own drawings for which angle pairs lead to certain equation types. Again, since I knew the common mistake in all my classes was to set up the equations incorrectly, I now knew to devote time to that specific part of the process. So, here students are given the equation structure, and they need to create the drawing that leads to it. I'm really trying to get them to focus on structure before solving anything. Finally, after students completed their drawings, then they had the opportunity to work three problems all the way through. They set up the equations and then actually solved them. Free chances in the warm-ups that follow the next day were critical in my classroom. I wouldn't know that students needed to work on this specific part of the solving process unless I used formative assessment to check their understanding. Gathering common errors allows me to see where I need to focus my attention, and free chances have been a great tool for uncovering student understanding. Let's end this video by answering a couple questions. First, what part of the class do we give free chances? And how long do students have to complete them? Good questions. I almost always do free chances at the end of class during the last 10 minutes. So students have about 10 minutes to finish. And finally, how often do we do these? Like I mentioned earlier, I do at least one free chance per unit, and it's usually on the third day of the unit. If the unit is long, then I may do a second free chance as well. The key is making sure we allow enough time for students to learn a little before doing the free chance. That's why the third day of the unit is usually ideal. Also, I wouldn't overdo free chances so students don't get tired of them. Instead, we can find other ways to do formative assessment, like simple checks for understanding on the fly during class. Now that we've seen what free chances are and how to use them, it's time for an assignment. Go ahead and create your own free chance for the unit that you mapped out in the previous section of our workshop. Find two to four 80 level questions to help you uncover student understanding. I'll see you when you're done.